remind you before we get started that again you can get an app for from one of the app stores so you can follow us online see the archive files um, worship and everything right from our web page but let's open in prayer first father thank you Thank you that you meet with us. Thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord, we've come tonight to praise you, to exalt you, to glorify you, to magnify your name. You are worthy of all praise. Lord, as we look tonight, we see again your patience, your patient calling man to return to you patient and long-suffering. Lord, thank you that you have been so patient and so kind with us. Teach us tonight. Instruct us in your ways. Grant us that grace that leads us to repentance that we would follow and we would obey you wherever you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful for where streams of abundance go. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert space. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name on the road, marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Yes, Lord, we praise you and honor you, Lord. We want to adore our God. We thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. We bow our hearts. We lift our hands. We turn our eyes to you again. And we surrender to the truth that all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration. 
of God. Receive our adoration. Wonderful you are. We choose to leave it all behind and turn our eyes towards the prize. The upward call of God in Christ. You have our hearts. Now take our lives. Receive our adoration. In Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration. How wonderful you are. Every soul you say sings out. Everything you make resounds. All creation standing now, lifting up your name. Rejoining on the angels' song, we gather to your reign. Children of our Father's arms, shouting out your praise. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Receive our adoration. Jesus, Lamb of God, receive our adoration, how wonderful you are, how wonderful you are, how wonderful you are, Jesus, how wonderful you are. a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God. And forgiveness Where all your love and love Comes like a flood Comes flowing down At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in awe of you, where your love ran red, and my sin washed white, I owe 
stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I bring you more than a song or a song in itself it's not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world, no one can. How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for me I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. And it's all about you, Jesus. And it's all about you, Jesus. 
Yes, and I got to be reminded all the time. It's all about the Lord Jesus, not about us being up here. Humble 
there is no one else who has my heart. Jesus, you have me completely. Every breath that I breathe, I am absolutely in love. Jesus, I am yours forever. All of Yes, we love you, Lord, because you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for your promises, and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Malachi. We're going to be looking at Malachi chapter 2 tonight. Malachi chapter 2. I titled the message, again, not really creative, but Malachi, uh, um, it, it's his appeal to backsliders, really part two. Let's open in prayer. Father, again, we come humbly before you. We acknowledge that we need you every hour, every moment. We acknowledge, Lord, that we're bent towards sin. We know that we are changed and transformed, but yet we still have this old nature tugging and pulling in the world around us, calling us. Lord, we need more of you and less of ourselves. Thank you that your word will not come back void, that you will accomplish tonight exactly what you intend to accomplish Make us the men, the women that you would have us be in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting when we talk about the word backslide or backslider. The word backslide in the context, that is a Christian context, involves a, a moving away from Christ rather than moving toward him. Many people, when they make a profession of faith, they'll, they'll be in the front row, they're excited, they want to hear God, and, and little by little, they work their self to the back of the church and then eventually out the door. The world's pulling upon them. And they fall back in the same rut or groove that we were in before. They begin to hang out with the same friends knowing that the things that they did would stumble them. See, a backslider, again, is someone who is going the wrong way spiritually. He or she is regressing instead of progressing. The Christian walk is one that is constantly moving forward, that each and every year you're moving closer to Christ and you're more like Christ. The backslider had at one time demonstrated, again, as I mentioned, that commitment to, to be sitting at the feet of Jesus and maintained a certain, again, standard of behavior. 
outwardly, there was a change in him, but there was something that maybe didn't even change in his heart completely. Something he was not willing to deal with. And what happens is he reverts back to the old ways or Peter talks about like a dog returning to its vomit. Some people, though, use the word backslide to mean a, a person has lost his or her, again, salvation. If a person has been born again and they're saved, even if they're backslidden, they do not lose their salvation. They are kept by the power of God until that day. And again, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 28 and 29 again, reminds us of the security that we have in him, that we're kept by his power. No one can snatch you out of his hand. How do you think you can jump out of his hand if no one can snatch him, snatch you out of his hand? See, the Lord doesn't kick you out of his family because you backslid, but you will suffer consequences. God disciplines those he loves. It'll be evident in that discipline. And the discipline is always to, to bring the person back to him. He doesn't want to see them go through the things that they often do and choose. Now, some people associate a, a backslider with apostate. They're two different creatures. Apostate is one, again, who could go through the moves, say the right words, speak the right theology even, but but has never really made a profession of faith. He only believes in his mind, but he's never really learned to walk it out in his heart. He's so busy trying to keep the rules, he's just not living a life of love. And that apostate walks away and never comes back. God, God will not bring apostate back. Apostate is one when he walks away, oftentimes criticizes the church, criticizes Christianity, criticizes Jesus, and never comes back and no desire to. Revealing that they were really not true believers at all. Well, in our text tonight, we're going to see that the priest had, they had failed to instruct the people in God's covenant. See, this is, this is what they were called to do. We'll talk about that more, but the priest's attitude and behavior, uh, it didn't change. They, they, they began allowing people to sin. They turned their back. Now, no priest, no pastor is to go around sin, sniff, and fall finding. But these were people that were going to see that openly were sinning. And because they were, again, funding them, their offerings were coming in, they were living, they would not say, hey, brother, you're in sin. And they were robbing God of his glory, misrepresenting God. So what we have is these irresponsible religious leaders. There are many that we call them hirelings. They're, they're, it's just a job to them. They really don't care. And they're looking to fleece the flock. Now, notice again in verses 1 and 2 that God's commandment to his priest, it's in verses 1 through 4, actually. It says, now this is the commandment is for you, O priest. If you do not listen, if you do not take to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts. Now, the responsibility of the Levitical tribe, again, their, their function was to teach the word, teach the law to Israel. In one sense, they were, they were messengers of God. They, they took the word of God. They were entrusted with the word of God, and, and they were to pour this word of God into the people. They were to explain, to understand, to know. Now, the, what's important to understand that they were to officiate also at the altar, the sacrifices and everything that they were to do. But again, in verse, again, verse 2, notice again, if you do not listen, see the emphasis is upon hearing, not just hearing with understanding, but it goes on to act in obedience. We're not just to be 
hearers of the law, but doers of the law. We're to understand the very heart of God, that God wants the best for you and me. And, and, and you see these verses really tie in with Deuteronomy 6, verses 3 through 4. Follow with me on the screen. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. In a land flowing of milk and honey, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. This was something that they were to every day, this was part of their prayer, as part of their life. They were to hear and they were to obey. See, these two, again, in verse 10 of, of Malachi chapter 2 in, in Deuteronomy 6 4, they, they parallel. Collectively, again, there's allusions, reminders, again, that the, the people, again, the, their commitments by, by hearing and listening, and it would be shown in their commitment to Yahweh. They were to take it to heart, the, the leaders, the people. And, and this was and not a, it was an issue of will, not emotion. Sometimes people say, well, I don't feel like that. I don't believe that's what God wants. God has said what his word is. I don't feel that's right. But what does the Bible say? See, Malachi had in mind the, uh, the utter destruction of those who had violated, again, this is important to understand, God's commandment. God takes it very seriously when we do not take his word seriously. He will judge us very harshly. And this is what we're going to see. Now, look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 20 with me. The Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, and rebuke in all your, you undertake to do until you are destroyed, until you perish quickly upon the count of the evil of your deeds because of you have forsaken me. God takes his word and obedience very seriously. He wants obedience, not just sacrifice. Again, the importance of listening and obeying. Let's go back to verse 2 again. Then I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. Let me ask you a question. It's something for all of us to think about. Do we take God's word seriously when he speaks to us? Or do we kind of just kind of brush it away? Well, God really doesn't mean that. He didn't understand 2,000 years ago. God wants us to take it to heart. The priests weren't taking it to heart. The people weren't taking it to heart. The priests were a poor example to follow. They not only had no intention of obeying, but they were even now disobedient. You know, sometimes when people hear it, they don't want to believe it. I've had people knock on my door, and, and I know they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And, and I said, if I can show you in the Scripture that Jesus is the Son of God, would you believe? And they say, no. It's the end of the conversation. It shows me they're not teachable, they're not open. They don't care what the scripture says. They believe what they want to believe. They've already chosen, even though they don't realize it, to disobey the word of God and misrepresent God. Look with me in our text of Malachi again, verse 3. Behold, I'm going to rebuke your offspring, and I will spread refuge on your faces and refuge on your feast, and you'll be taken away with it. See, the, the word refuge... Refuse is dung in the King James Version. Very graphic view when you stop and think about it. Showing how unfaithful the priest would be. Imagine yourself being a, a pastor, a, a priest, you're standing, you're teaching, and, and God would just again say, I'm going to rebuke you, and I'm going to spread refuge all over your face. It was a wake-up call. God wanted them to listen and think about what they're saying and what they're doing before it's too late. 
If they continue in that way, it's gonna show that they're apostate. If they're a backslider, then they will return when God disciplines them. So the language is graphic. As God viewed these unfaithful priests as worthy as the, the most unthinkable type of thing of disgrace could be is to have, have this dung flung upon you. And it, of course, it's, it's symbolic, but this is what God thinks of them. The purposes and such is a warning to shake them up, to wake them out of their complacency. There are those today that believe that the church is lethargic, complacent. They don't take God's word seriously. They're not walking the Lord. There's some that are saved, but, but many think they're saved. They're not even saved. And not much difference because after this book of Moab, uh, Malachi, there's 400 years of silence. And it was during a time, like the book of Judges, every man was doing what was right in their own eyes. Look around. Isn't that what we see in our culture today in almost every country? People believing what they want to believe. No one really seeking to know the, the truth. How they need to be shook up, woke up before it's too late. There's a time of judgment and tribulation coming and, and the church will be taken out of the way and when the tribulation comes, it's to, to wake up the nation of Israel. God's going to deal with them, but also to, to shake up the heathen. But those who have heard the gospel prior to that time will be blinded. And they will exalt the Antichrist at that time. And we'll be talking more about that on Sunday morning in a few weeks. Look with me in our text again in Malachi chapter 2, verse 4. Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you and that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Now he's speaking to those religious leaders. Again, the, the making of this covenant Levi, there's no formal recording of this in the book. We just know that he put them in charge. It was the Levites that were responsible for taking care of the altar, the teaching of, of God's word. In fact, Moses and Aaron were the tribe of Levi back in Exodus, we learn. And again, it, it, and that brought prom, prominence to this group, and it would continue. So God had long ago set apart this tribe of Levi. You were to be a priesthood, full-time service to him. And today, Peter talks about that we, that is the church, are holy priesthood. And that's kind of to shake up and wake up the Jewish people because, hey, well, we're the priest. What do you mean you're the priest? And we can boldly go to that throne of grace. And we represent God. We're to rightly divide that word, truth. We're to go and make disciples and teach them to obey. Well, God, again, has representatives. His representatives are those who take him seriously with the greatest reverence. We need to revere him. He's holy. He's just. We don't flippantly talk about him. We don't take his word again lightly. When he says he's coming again, he's coming again. And, and he says judgment's coming, it's coming. And, and there's going to be a time that it's too late for anybody to make a decision at that point. But now he says, I'm going to rebuke your offspring. It means again to to look, I'm about to rebuke again. And this could happen at any time. That word rebuke, it's strong. It means to change, to stop, to replace. Uh, Jesus, the same word was, was used when Jesus rebuked the waves, the wind, the storms on the Sea of Galilee. And it stopped, and it was peace. God, in the end, will deal with it. And we need to bow our knees now, and we shouldn't wait to be forced. 
See, if the priest had not taken taking God seriously until now, they better start. Again, it, there's a time that it's going to be too late. One is, is a backslider and God is going to have them return and the other one is going to show their apostate. Just because you're born of a certain tribe doesn't make you holy or better. The person says a sinner's prayer and he thinks he's right with God, not if he doesn't walk it out, not, not if he doesn't continue in the word. If they don't quit defiling the the altar. The Lord's going to render is what he's going to say here. He's going to render them spiritually unclean, ritually unclean. One, because they're violating the covenant. They're breaking the contract invoked. There's negative consequences for their, for their choices, but do they take it seriously? Do you and I take it seriously? As a pastor, I'm just as accountable, if not more accountable, than you are. How do we take his word? We're standing on holy ground when we're standing in his presence. And when you and I choose to walk in obedience, there's this blessing of obedience. And then there's the, the punishment of disobedience. Oh, you can think about there are several places you can find this in the end of Deuteronomy, the blessings and the curses. If you choose to walk in his ways, you'll be blessed just walking through life. But again, if you choose to disobey, there's consequences. Let me read though from Leviticus 26 verses 14 and 16. But if you do not obey me and do not carry out all of these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out my commandments, see, if you don't carry them out, he says you're abhorring it, and so as to break my covenant, the covenant relationship they're in. They're taking it lightly, and in verse 16 he continues, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, Fever that will waste away in your eyes and cause the soul to pine away. And also you will sow your seed uselessly for your enemies will eat it up. Now we're not saved by works, but as we go through life and we're obedient, we are blessed by keeping the good works that God's prepared for us before the foundation of the world, but they don't save us. They often can tell whether a person's a believer or not because how they do this works. Do they do it from a heart of love or are they just doing it to try and find favor with God? Every believer has favor with God. And he will, he will again, discipline those who are disobedient to return them that they would come back to his favor, come back to his grace. So God's covenant with his priest, let me read this time in Malachi, but chapter 2, verse 5 in the Amplified. Notice what it says. My covenant on my part with Levi was to give him life and peace because on his part and on the reverent and worshipful fear with which the priest would revere me and stand in awe of my name. This is what God had really planned for them. God wants the very best for them. He was providing for them if, if they would just follow him. It talks about, again, in the, uh, this idea in the NASB, a, a covenant of peace. Uh, again, it's mentioned in Numbers 25, verse 11 and 13. It's in connection with uh, Phineas, the Aaronite, again, and uh, a priest at that time. Again, it's, it's, it's mentioned, but we don't have much upon this. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40. So you shall keep my statues and his commandments, which I'm giving you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may live long on the land of which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. So God's giving this land to Israel for eternity. 
But if they don't obey, they will be out of the land. They will suffer the consequences. But God has made a covenant with them, and he will bring them back, maybe that next generation. Disobedience always takes us away from the blessing that God has for us each and every moment of every day. Another translation uses that your days may be prolonged and again in the land. The idea is if you keep, again, my commandments, that you can stay in this land, but if you don't, I'm going to take you out and you'll be set apart. He'd bring again the Babylonians, the Syrians, and down, and they would be led away into bondage until they were dealt with. And then they would come back and he would bring them back into the land just as he brought them back in the land in 1948. And by the way, for those 2,000 years, there were always Jewish people still remaining in Jerusalem and in the land that whole time. God always has a faithful remnant. Look with me in our text, verse 6. True instruction was in my mouth and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and he turned many back from iniquity. Now, what Malachi's doing is he's turning back to the historical priest. He's reminding the historical responsibilities of a priest, that they were to be God-fearing priests. They're to be concerned in being truthful, accurate teaching of the word, interpretation of the, of the word, uh, the rendering of the legal decisions, because that was a responsibility to help resolve these problems among the people. He was to exemplify, again, the truth. And every day walk in righteousness in his daily living. His life was to influence people positively by turning them away from sin himself. You know, these things are true in our own life too. When you and I choose to walk in that straight and narrow path, it is, has a positive effect on those around us. Again, he's using the law as the basis. The priests were called upon daily to rule in the principles of holiness. What is our plumb line today? It's always the word of God. Not, not what somebody said, a, a, a priest or something else that contradicts the word of God. It's the word of God. So he goes back and he explains that. I want to take you back just for a moment to Genesis 5.22. It says, then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah and he had other sons and daughters. Now, you and I, it's hard to comprehend living 300 years, but let alone walk with 300 years. What is it like to walk with the Lord? How can I walk with the Lord? We, every one of us here and listening online struggle with walking with the Lord every single day because we're human beings. Well, I think there's some verses that will help us if we put these to memory. It begins in Philippians 4, chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Notice what it says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So it's, it's going through this life, talking to God when Enoch walked with God. He was in this constant union, companionship, intimacy with him. Prayer is talking to God. And then it goes on in verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, notice, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You ever have a problem with thoughts bombarding your mind, distracting you from thinking on Christ? Things taking away to, to the way of the world. Sometimes it's anger about the way the world is or, or it's the way a, a, a girl is dressed or the language of somebody else or somebody says a, a joke, an immoral joke and it's humorous and you laugh and you're drawn away. See, the thing is when we walk in communion with God, this is important. We stay in that communion. This is what, he, what we're, we're trying to do is we have that communion, and when we do, we have this peace. 
again, this peace of God that surpasses all comprehension, it guards our hearts, our minds. So, so when we see something that is in more, something that's not right, something that's a temptation, draws away, we need to turn away and turn back to God. And then verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell upon these things. Focus on what's good in this life. This life is rotten in many ways, I agree, but focus on the good. Focus on the good and what God is doing in someone's life and he's doing around you. In verse 9, these things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So it's, again, it's, it's not just being a, a listener, it's being a doer of these. Practice them. Make it a, a life, a habit. This is the only way that you and I can ever walk in a way that's honoring God. But the priests were teaching in such a way their life was an example. And we can't blame them. That's their choice. But we can make a difference. We can will to live for God today. The man who has a reverence to God, is, it's going to be evidenced in his life. Meticulous care and his outward worship, being a, a living sacrifice. The one basic qualification was giving true instruction. What the Word of God says. Clearly, the teaching involved more than, again, just this intellectual teaching. It, it involved, again, a person walking integrity is equally important, but not willing to compromise. That's what they were guilty of. We're going to see they were guilty of compromising what they knew was right. Verse 7, for the, the lips of the priest should preserve knowledge. So they're not preserving knowledge. And men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he's a messenger of the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is the, the head of the armies of heaven. Verse 7 confirms again this responsibility, this high calling again of the, the priesthood or a pastor or a leader, an elder or a deacon that they're to take it seriously. And this is so important. Implying this term, a messenger, a messenger of the Lord of hosts. It's, what an awesome responsibility. One that you're called a child of God, but that you're his messenger. That you bring the message of hope to people that are hopeless in this life. Going through and you, you see the lights are on, but nobody's home. The vanity. You see them headed for that cliff and they're walking that way. And you have those, those right words. So it's an awesome responsibility. That just as uh, angels and prophets, he is to be spoken from God. Uh, we are to preserve. Preserve it in word, but preserve it in action. The people see God in us. They didn't realize or didn't think about that they were entrusted with really this, this sacred deposit. The value of the, the word of God. The knowledge, God, that is revealed in the, in the Torah, the law of Moses. Jesus would talk about it later. All of these things spoke about me. The message was always there. But it was all in their head. Deuteronomy 33, verse 9 and 10 says this. Who said to his father and to his mother, I did not consider them where he did not acknowledge his brothers, nor did he regard his own sons, for they observed, for they observed your word and kept your covenant. And they shall teach your ordinances to Jacob and your law to Israel. And they shall put incense before you and the whole burnt offerings on the altar. And this is speaking about the, what the Levites were supposed to do, but they weren't doing that. They were doing what's right in their own eyes. And then in Deuteronomy 17, verse 9, it says, So you shall come to the Levitical priesthood or the, the judge who was in the office in those days, and you shall inquire of them, 
and they will declare to you the verdict of the cases. So when there was a, a division between people, something that was unjust, they would come and they, they would give a verdict based upon the very word of God. So there were function of these, these guardians of, of Yahweh's covenant so that, that the people would do what's right in God's eyes. And when people come to church some days, sometimes, I'm hearing this and, and other pastors are telling me the same thing. They're just coming to put a Band-Aid on. Just tell me how I can be a better businessman. Just tell me how I can get through this fight or that fight. They really don't want to know God. When you know God and you know his word, then things change in your life. They were to play the, the role as teachers of God's law to the laity by the word and by the example. That's the same thing for you and me today. And that's, again, why it says be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within, that people see there's something different. They were to equip the people to uphold God's laws, God's word. The priest of Mount Kai's audience had promoted waywardness in the, the people. It pr promoted sin by, by not dealing with the sin through their own unfaithfulness and their false teaching and leading people were astray. They were so corrupt. They had become, as I mentioned in the beginning, they were, they were like hirelings in that sense. Mercenaries just in there for the, the money. The name of priests had become a word of contempt among the people. A pastor, a priest, was the same in this culture today. You've heard all those that have fallen. Well-known people in the ministry, worldwide ministries, and are living a life of sin, totally separate, and then revealed, surely, as the scripture says, surely your sin will find you out. In verse 8, we see really God's contempt for the priest. But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by, my, by the instruction, and you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. God's contempt. He says you've turned away. That's what a backsliding is, turn away. Apostate is fall away. Similar but different. So there's three accusations. One, you've turned aside from the way. You've caused others to stumble. Number two. And number three, you've corrupted the covenant of Levi. It's no longer, the, the, it wasn't a holy law that they were teaching. It was corrupted. It was impure. Verse nine, so I also have made you despised, abased before people, so that you are not keeping my ways, but you're showing partiality in the instruction. See, the priest should have had administered the law in, in, a, in kindness, in fairness, in justice. But they had not done so. And, and so God's saying, you know, that says, again, I'm going to, again, this this retribution will fall upon you because you despised my name. When God talks about his name, it speaks of his character. The law that they were teaching was dishonoring God, showing disrespect. Dis it was irreverent what they were teaching. In fact, look with me back in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6 on the screen. It says, a son honors his father, a servant his master. Then if I'm your father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Arrogantly pretending. Malachi was very angry with the priest because, again, although they were God's messengers, they simply did not respect God's word, or they simply didn't know it. Ignorant of it, one or the other. We don't know for sure, but God's indicating that they knew it. It was right there. It was in the Torah. They could read it. But they hadn't spent time in it. The result was this lack of knowledge. They, they were leading the people astray. We failed to realize that 
What we say can stumble and lead people away to Christ, or it can bring them into the presence of God. The words we speak should bring healing and refreshment, not strife, not division, not sin. Pastors and leaders, God's people, we must know God's word. We must hide it in our hearts, what it says, what it means, and really how to apply it to our life. It's not enough just to know what it, it, it says and what it means, but if we can't apply it, we can't be obedient and walk it out, what good is it if you know it? If it doesn't change your life, and it wasn't changing their life, it was stumbling the lives of others. It was ridiculous for these religious leaders to suppose that God would show favor to them. They, you know, again, they were showing partiality to, to the corrupt, and, and, and they expect God to show favor on them. Bless me, Lord, bless me. And then we continue to practice a life of sin. And this is what they were doing. We need to always to let our standards be those presented in God's word. Whatever I say, you, you need to go back and say, does it line up? See, when we're, we're talking about these things that are important in James 2, verses 1 through 9, again, it, it talks about plain favorites. It's seen in God's eyes as contemptible in God's sight. And yet that's what they were doing. I know they didn't have James, but there's passage after passage in the Old Testament that speaks against it. They didn't know God's word. It really means that when we don't know God's word, we need to spend more time, not just in God's word, but in the presence of God, sitting at his feet and listening to him, hearing his heart, knowing what is pleasing to him. See, Israel's covenant had become unfaithfulness. So Malachi addresses the, the social evils surrounding marriage and divorce, how they relate to one another, how they related to God, their unfaithfulness, and, and really the breaking of faith, showing they really had no regard for his word. They had no regard for what God said. Not unlike Hosea, Malachi, mixed with ideas of idolatry, of adultery, physical and spiritual inner marriage. What did they learn when they went into bondage? Well, first of all, God has a remnant. But they had to learn all over again. I hope that's not true for us. That we need to, to move on to the deeper things. See, these Jewish men were divorcing their wives to marry non-Jewish women. This was a, a double sin in a sense. Disastrous effects that would be in rearing the children unequally yoked. And then in verse 10, notice what it says. Do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother and so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Again, the disputation does not begin with, a, with divine speech, but really with the voice of Malachi, isn't it? You know, in every message, you, you hear God, but there's always a little bit of a person there. A person has a reverence for God, a love for God. You know, when you see the, the evil, the corruption in this world, or for me, when I hear somebody misrepresenting God or teaching the word of God and twisting the scripture and, and to say something it doesn't say, I, my heart it angers and I can't say it's a holy anger. There's part of it maybe is holy anger, but there's this, but who do they think they are? And I could begin to judge in my own heart. Well, God will deal with them. And I need, as you need, 
to be faithful to the one that's in front of you, behind you, beside you, faithful to whatever God has called you to do in the ministry. It begins, again, verse 10, with this rhetorical question, have we not one father? He reminds them that God is their father. Through Abraham, is called Israel's father in various contexts, especially in the, in the New Testament. God is called Israel's father. Let me show you in Exodus 4, verse 22. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And then in Malachi 1, 6, again, as we read earlier, notice what it says. A son honors his father, a servant his master. Then if I am your father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? So the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Can you imagine having kids and they say, you're not my father? How do I show you disrespect? How much more a heavenly father who created the heavens, the earth, has blessed you beyond anything you could ever imagine has been patient and long-suffering with you and me with some of the choices we made. Continually drawing us to him. Disciplines because he loves us. Hurtful those words are. God's people were guilty of defiling the sanctuary by marrying a, a daughter of a strange God. See, this religious marriage was not cross-culture. That, that's... That wasn't bad in every case. But it's breaking the spiritual commitment. This is important to worship God exclusively. They were worshiping, bringing women in that worship other gods. You look at the life of Solomon. Solomon is a classic example of that. Even today, you have a, a, a Protestant and you have a Catholic. Where did they go to church? Or a Jewish person and a, a Catholic person. How are they going to be raised? The division. Or a believer and an unbeliever. In this case, they were, again, marrying those of, again, worshipped other gods. Deuteronomy 7, verse 3 says this, Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them, you shall not give your daughters your sons, nor shall you take daughters for your sons. This is when they would go into the promised land, the Canaan out culture. Now, ethnic intermarriages were not forbidden is quite evident in the marriages of Moses and you know the, the Cushionite again wife. And then there's Rahab and there's Ruth and there's Abigail. And very likely other women who accepted the true faith of Israel. And by the way, on Sunday morning, I'm teaching from the book of Ruth, our kinsman deemer, as we move toward, again, Easter. We're going to see that kinsman redeemer leads us to Christ. Well, what Malachi taught about divorce is important. It must be understood in a historical Again, in its biblical context. And the challenge facing, again, the Judean community after they've been in exile. Now they've got to reestablish everything. They've got to start all over. They were taking discipline. You want to know what hell's like. You want to know what sin's like. I'm going to lead you to a place that you can experience that. And God brought only a remnant out. The worst thing that God could ever do to you or me is let us have our own way. Look at verses 10 and 11 again one more time. We see the word treacherously, which is described like a, a traitor involving a betrayal or violating an allegiance, allegiance to a, 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 a pledged faith. Strong words are necessary when, when he's dealing with Israel and, and Judah. The, the covenant of the fathers, this mosaic, again, covenant they had just pushed away from them. They treated it as profane and contempt. 
And this is what Malachi, his whole message is right now, is in dealing with this sin. And, and they're kind of, uh, what do you mean? How have we done this? He's introducing the spiritual destructive, again, element of this, this covenant community. What is happening to them? Look in verse 12 in our text says, as for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob and everyone who awakes and answers and who presents an offering to the Lord of his host. Now, again, the words, again, God's describing that it's detestable back in, in verse 12 here. Again, it, these things that they're doing, they're detestable and God's going to deal with them. He's, the Lord's going to cut off. He's going to bring them out. This generation is going to be separated. 400 years of silence afterwards. Not a word from God. Because he didn't want to hear. Notice he said, the Lord will cut off from the tents of Jacob. Jacob oftentimes refers to, again, the, the nation Israel, but in a backslidden place. They're backsliders at this place. Jacob, everyone who awakes and answers, who presents an offering to the Lord. See, this is serious defilement, what God is saying that they're doing here. And this was a failure due to the priest because the priest would just turn his head and allow and it was coming again from the pulpit, allowing them to live and walk a life of sin. Verse 13, this is another thing that you do. You cover the altar with your tears, with weeping, with groaning, because no longer regard the offering and accept it with favor from your hand. See, God wasn't the offering didn't mean anything to him because it wasn't from a heart. It wasn't coming with reverence or obedience. The prophet's drawing attention to examples of their unfaithfulness, their excessive display of uh, emotions, uh, it probably intended and apparently to, to move God, oh God, and, and they're crying and they're weeping and there are people that do this every week in some churches and and hopefully if they weep long enough or gnash their, their skins, then God will grant them favor. God just wants them to walk in obedience, to honor him. All these crocodile tears that they have, they're, they're, they go nowhere with God. And, and they're wondering, why? Why aren't you responding? Because it was pagan-like worship manifested in tearful wailing, but it wasn't, it wasn't this, this broken and contrite heart. It wasn't the godly sorrow that was leading them to repentance. It was just groaning and hoping that they would influence God. It reminds us again when of First Kings 18, verse 26 through 30, let me read. And then they took an ox which was given to them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. And there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they had made, and it came about at noon. And, and Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is God. Either he's occupied or gone aside or on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice, cut themselves according to the custom with the swords and lances until blood gushed out upon them. And when midday was past, they raved until the time of offering and evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been tore down. Then the wood was piled up, the water was poured out. He simply prayed to God and the fire from heaven come down and consumed and accepted it. Their actions were like those who were crying out for Baal from morning to night. And there are those that still do that today. Notice again the self-inflicted pain, which is taken as worship. It's not worship. 
Verse 14 continues and it says, yet you say for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and your wife of your youth because whom you have dealt treacherously though she is your companion, your wife by covenant. See, they had deserted their wives. They had deserted them for another woman, a pagan woman, a foreign marriage that was strictly forbidden in the covenant law, not for ethnic. They were apostate. Apostate wives. The danger was what they would be drawn and led away. Marriage and divorce was the major issue here. Some were backsliders, some just didn't believe. They, they quit on God. See, they had come back out of bondage and God had not shown them himself and they were doing what was right in their own eyes and, and they just got tired of waiting for God. Aren't you happy that God doesn't get tired of waiting for you? He's patient, long-suffering, wishing none perish, patiently working, picking us up when we fall. When we confess, he forgives us and picks us up and cleans us and puts us back on that path. But we're so impatient with God. Their weeping and wailing would achieve absolutely nothing because of their moral wrong, their, their sin. Their sin was hindering their relationship. Their sin hindered the prayer. Their marriage vows were, were broken. See, Malachi explains that God was acting as a witness. He knew it all. People often forget that a marriage is not just between two people. It is a covenant between God and man and woman. And they had violated the covenant with God. It's not just a, a contract. It's not just a two-way relationship, but a covenant is three-way relationship in which the, the couple is accountable to God. And the Lord is the witness to that covenant. Again, let me go back. I mentioned this without a verse, but it's 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partner has righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship with light and darkness? You know, this is what they were doing. The Amplified in Malachi 2.15 says this, And did not God make you and your wife one flesh? Did not one make you and preserve your spirit alive? Why? Did God make you two, one? Because he sought a godly offspring from your union therefore take heed to yourselves let no one deal treacherously or be faithless to his wife of his youth you see the responsibilities put on the man it doesn't speak about the woman but on the man didn't the Lord make you one with your wife in body in spirit you're his Genesis 2, 24 says this, For this reason a man should leave his father, his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One in flesh and one in spirit. And so then perhaps Malachi derived his understanding from this marriage covenant, the importance of it, and the husband's obligation. Verse 16, notice what it, the scripture says again. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. There's the warning. The expression, the covenant of garment, it, it, it speaks in this case of violence. It, it's a figure of a speech defiling the, the character of this person. Psalm 109, verse 18 says this, but he clothed himself with cursing as with his garment, and it entered into his body like water and like oil into his bones. And then in verse 17, notice again what it says. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, how have we wearied him? 
if that you say everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them, where is the God of justice? Well, again, there was this disillusionment. Again, the, the rebuilding of the temple and all that went on and decade after decade and no supernatural event, no return again of the Lord to Zion. They failed to see the mercy of God. Sometimes when God's mercy is all around us and we fail to see it because we're not looking for God. We're looking for what's wrong. The people had wore out God in their accusations. They're complaining, grumbling, murmuring, just like the children of Israel in the wilderness. They began as a result of living indifference to God, calloused, lacking, again, spiritual discernment, complacent. The people persisted in cynical expressions of innocence and just trying to justify themselves as many try to today. The prophet faced them with this imminent judgment that they didn't want to hear, they didn't want to accept, telling them that God was coming. And they needed to be refined, they needed to be purified. They mocked and laughed. Well, we need to resolve to be faithful to God. We, we need to decide to, I want to be faithful. God, make me faithful. Help me, God, to, to go about your kingdom business, especially if we're a religious leader. We need to be determined to be faithful to the calling. God is the one that makes you faithful if you just thrust yourself upon him. You choose to walk with him as Enoch walked with him. We need to choose to respect and give honor to him and exalt his name above every other day. We need to support those religious leaders that are faithful to God. We need to deal honestly, fairly with people. We need to call sin, sin. And when there's things wrong, we need to admit there's wrong. But when we get to the bottom line, what we saw tonight, if, if you're unmarried, you need to determine that to marry a believer, not even to go out with an unbeliever, not to be unequally yoked, because you don't know where your heart will go. You need to marry one that wants to help make you become everything that God would have you be, and you need to do the same for them. And if you're already married to an unbeliever, you need to live so much like Christ that she wants to know the Savior that you know. This is really what God wants for us. And it wouldn't hurt if we would just renew our marriage vows with our wife to show how much we love them and we love our God. And we want to honor him. Would you stand with me, please? Oh, Father God, help us that we will honor you, not with just lip service, but with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. We want to glorify you. We want to be faithful in every way, but we need your help, your spirit to make us faithful. We need you to transform our hearts, circumcise our hearts, Lord, that we would give ourselves completely to you. There would be more of you and less of ourselves each and every day. That we would choose to live for you and esteem others higher than ourselves and take your word and hide it in our hearts. Father, we pray for those that are listening. We pray that, Lord, that you would open up their hearts to know you, to know your word, 
Find peace and comfort and hope in you. Realize that you are their rock, their strength when they call upon you. Father, those that are going through the persecution, wherever they're at, that again, they'll recognize that you're there with them, that you will never leave them or forsake them, that they can endure all things, for you will strengthen them. So, Lord, thank you that your word has power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and your spirit will enable, empower those who call upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, for such great, great salvation, Lord. And Lord, Father, yes, we do. We do just do our own thing lots of times, Lord. But thank you for your patience, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you for, Lord, just showing us what you have for us in the future. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.